What am I? Nagaya Wogi, Nagaya Woenga Marago. Come without Bianga, come without Varangra. Maram wrong, Tianaganaga. Maram wrong by Alia. Camera go, goody pemo. You get it go. Welcome to my grandmother's country, Camaragal country, where our traditions and links to the land and the waterways is ongoing from the past until the present. Taronga is a unique situation of shared custodianship. Uh, they are doing something here which is continuing Indigenous knowledge and continuing that respect for Indigenous land. If you look after country, tread lightly, listen, and feel country, Camaragal country will look after you in the future. What am I? Welcome. Welcome to Camaragal country. Welcome to the land of my ancestors. Welcome to Taronga. Yanis. I hope for a future full of fish, where oceans, lakes and rivers are teeming with life and we can live in harmony, not against nature. Hi everyone, my name is Alexis and I want to welcome you to Taronga Zoo and to this exciting virtual classroom in celebration of Sustainable Seafood Week. Now I'm here in the enrichment labs of Taronga Zoo and I've got Matt Nelson with me. He's an education officer at the zoo and he's going to tell us a little bit about what some of the fun activities on the desk are. Hi Alexis, it's great to have you here today and we're really excited to be broadcasting from Taronga. It's very special to have the MSC team on site. We thought we'd duck in really quickly and just talk about the space that we're in here in the Institute of Science and Learning. It's a pretty cool place. This is the enrichment lab where our behavioural biologists work to design enrichment items that go into all of the different animal precincts throughout the zoo, like this simple pine cone here that's filled with a berry oat mixture that's going to head into our primates to encourage natural behaviours like we see in the wild, like tool use to pick out the food morsels within it, or just that act of using their dexterous hands to pry apart something like this. It's a really interesting part of the zoo, and there's some cool stories that come out of this place as well. That's going to be something this guy will enjoy, is that right? That's right. And and one of the other things that we can't show you right now because they're hanging out in the freezer is relevant to our marine team, which are some very fishy ice blocks which are headed down to our seal precinct for them to enjoy. Thank very you very cool. much. That's wonderful. And no worries. what great work the Taronga staff are doing to keep all the animals entertained. That's right. I'll leave you to it. Thanks. So in this lesson, we're going to be exploring the topic of science and food systems. So we're going to focus on seafood in Australia, which is an essential source of animal protein for one in five people living on the planet today. And it's an essential source of vitamins and minerals. Millions of people also depend on the seafood industry for their livelihoods or for their jobs. But in the past 50 years, the world's population has more than doubled. And with 7.85 billion people living on planet Earth, that's a lot of mouths to feed. So it puts a lot of pressure on the systems and the people that grow, farm and catch the food we eat. In this lesson, we're going to learn about how the food systems we use to produce seafood in Australia are being redesigned for a more sustainable future. In the past 50 years, the amount of seafood we produce has increased by four times. So during this lesson, we're going to learn about some of the ways to produce seafood more sustainably. We'll hear from a wild prawn fishery in Northern Australia and learn about responsible aquaculture. Then we'll have a special Q&A session where you can ask us anything about sustainable fishing and farming, as well as anything you might like to ask us about sharks. You can send all of your questions to us at Mentimeter by visiting menti.com and put in the code 9032-4818.
And to kick off today's special event, we have someone very exciting for you to meet. So on stage, I've got Paul Maguire, who is the Director of Education, and we're about to meet also our, one of our unit supervisors here in the Marine Mammal Department, and this is Jose Altuna. And then there's another special keeper coming out, one of our fantastic keepers with someone very special for you to meet. Now, who have we got here, Jose? So this is Nala. She is one of our very precious Australian sea lions. In fact, she is a mum. So she's actually um, basically one of our very important breeding program females. So um, she's an endangered species. These guys, as we said earlier, there's only about 10,000 of them left out there in the wild. Um, and obviously, being one of our breeding individuals, she's done a fantastic job for her species. Jose, people would see what Nala's doing now and, and understand that this is probably a behaviour they might do in the wild. But can you explain to us what Addie's doing? Lots of different things that she's doing. There's very subtle cues that she's giving. I think the guests would love to hear some of that. Absolutely. So a lot of what Nala is doing, obviously, on stage uh, and in the water is porpoising, basically one of her natural behaviours. Addie, though, is basically one of Nala's trainers. So we, what we do here at Taronga is obviously do a lot of husbandry behaviours. They're cooperative care behaviours. We've got to obviously be able to manage these guys. So we want, before anything else, we want to be able to train them to get used to us being close to them, being handled. But again, being able to care for them means having a close look at them, open their mouth, have a look at their flippers. Even in Nala's case, having just only bread, we want her to be able to roll over and expose her belly. So we were able to ultrasound Nala during that pregnancy process. In fact, she was so good at it, we um, we pretty much mapped the entire pregnancy um, growth rates and pump and everything else. So being able to work so closely with these guys is a huge part of our job. Now, folks, you might be able to pick up on the microphones we've got down on here on stage. Um, Addie is making a really, really high-pitched little whistle that she has uh, hanging around her neck. Can you tell us what that is actually for? So basically that bridge, uh, that, sorry, that whistle is actually called a bridge. That basically means it bridges the time frame between the behaviour happening and the actual reinforcement that's going to be happening. In this case, the reinforcement is fish. So as soon as Nala hears that, that little whistle, it means that fish is on, her, uh, on its way. So essentially, she thinks that that whistle is just as important as the food. So that's how we both obviously pair that behaviour, and Nala knows exactly she's done the right thing as soon as she hears that whistle. Very interesting stuff. Now, Addie also just got Nala to roll over onto her back. That's a really vulnerable area for a seal. Can you talk to us why she did that? Absolutely. So, obviously, getting her in that position, we call it a, a, a VIP, which is a ventral inspection position. Exposing that belly is obviously exposing these guys to, to predators out there in the wild. So, it takes a lot of trust to be able to get a seal to actually roll over onto their back um, and expose that belly. And as I said earlier, it serves a fantastic purpose, especially when we're trying to ultrasound her. Um, but yeah, at the same time, exposing um, her belly and being in that vulnerable position is actually quite a hard one to, to get these guys to do. Now, this is a very, very special species, and I think everyone would love to hear a bit more. This is an Australian species that's critically endangered. Can you talk us through a bit more of that? Yeah, so obviously um, hunting of seals isn't, um, isn't allowed anymore and it hasn't been for a very long time. A lot of the endemic species of seal in Australia um, were, were suffering from, from that um, situation. Unfortunately, though, for the Australian sea lion, their numbers just haven't recovered. They're still sitting around about that 10,000 individuals. Um, and although not as dramatically as they were dropping in, um, in previous years, their numbers are still declining. So unfortunately for these guys, we've really got to start managing um, obviously our fishing practices, the way we do things, and certainly learn a lot more about um, this amazing endemic species. Um, and certainly by having them and breeding them here at Toronto, we're learning a lot. They're an incredibly beautiful looking creature, an, an unusual looking seal, um, lighter on the belly with that beautiful steel grey on the back. Can you talk us through the difference in size between the males and the females? I think people would love to know that. Yeah, absolutely. So these guys uh, are obviously very special for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is obviously um, their, their colouring. They have probably one of the most specific colouring of any of the seals um, found out there. But specifically, the size between the male and the female, Nala's is pretty average at about 70 kilos, um, but the males can actually hit over 300 kilos, some individuals even close to 400 kilos. 
So basically, when you consider the two differences, they're pretty dramatic. In fact, when they were first discovered, they thought that the male and the female were in fact different. As much as we might see the female here with that, those grey and white tones, the males are actually brown all over, and a mature male actually develops a blonde cap on the top of their head. And obviously, relating to the size difference between the two, you can obviously see why they probably thought they were two different species. Absolutely. Incredibly important information to learn about these animals when you come to Taronga, and that these play an incredible important role in our oceans as well. Now, we've got this beautiful animal in our care, but we've also got an incredibly passionate keeper looking after Nala at the moment. I'm sure people listening would love to know what is in the day in the life of a, of a marine mammal keeper in a snapshot. Yeah, so obviously um, Addie here has been here at Taronga for a very long time. She's up to 35 years, so she is one of the most experienced keepers that we've got here at Taronga, although she doesn't look at a day over 20. Um, a very big part of what we do here at Taronga is, as we said, care for these amazing animals, um, rehab, rehabilitation, getting these guys back out into the wild is a very big part of what we do. Managing them, caring for them, um, again, is also a very big part. Um, a huge part is actually presenting to our audiences, talking a little bit what, about what affects these guys out in the wild and obviously what we can do at home um, to try and save some of our amazing marine species. Wow, thank you, Hayden, Jose, Addy and Nala. Next, we're gonna watch a short clip that explains our focus for today's lesson, which is sustainable fishing. Australians love the ocean. We depend on it for play, livelihoods and food. There are over 4 million boats in the global fishing fleet, supporting millions of jobs and providing over 1 billion people with their primary source of protein. But humans are only one of the species that depends on the ocean, and currently we are taking more from the sea than can be replaced naturally, leaving many fish stocks in decline. Humans have already taken more than 90% of the world's large fish stocks, including tuna and swordfish. In many fisheries, for every half a kilo of fish that goes to market, another four and a half kilos is thrown back into the sea dead as unusable bycatch. With fewer fish left in the ocean, seals, penguins and pelicans are increasingly coming into contact with fishing gear while looking for food, often leading to a very sad ending. We need to be better at sharing. You can make a positive difference to our marine life by picking fish with a tick. Fish with a tick have been certified by the Marine Stewardship Council as sustainable. This means the fishery works to protect stocks, the environment and jobs for the future, with minimal impact on other species. So this video tells us that we have to be very careful when we fish so as not to cause harm to the seals and other marine creatures that might get caught in our nets. But how exactly can we do this? We're going to hear now from Adrienne at the Northern Prawn Fishery, who will explain to us exactly what bycatch is, and then she's going to share with us some very exciting and clever designs that their fishery has come up with to stop and prevent bycatch from happening in their fishery. Hi, I'm Adrienne, and I work for the Northern Prawn Fishery Industry. One of my jobs is working with the fishers to reduce impacts of trawling on the marine environment and the creatures they interact with. The Northern Prawn Fishery is Australia's largest prawn trawl fishery and expands across the top of Australia, catching mainly banana and tiger prawn. And while the fishery is big in size, it's actually only a small portion of those waters that are fished, around 10%. So a little bit of history of the fishery it started in the 1960s with a few trawlers, but by the 1980s, there was nearly 300, which started impacting on the marine environment and on the prawns. So to become a sustainable fishery, a lot has changed over the years. We've gone from a peak of 282 trawlers in the 1980s to um, 52 by 2007. We've closed off areas to fishing to protect sensitive fish and prawn habitat like seagrass beds. And we have two fishing seasons. So the fishery is actually only open for six months of the year. 
We also do a lot of research with scientists to reduce the capture of unwanted marine animals, the big ones and the small ones. And one of our biggest success stories has been the introduction of turtle excluder devices, or we call them TEDs, which our fishers started using 20 years ago. We fish in tropical water, and as you probably know, there's a few special animals that live there, turtles and big sharks and rays. We have six species of turtle that call Northern Australia home. The flatback, the Pacific Ridley, the hawksbill, the loggerhead, green turtle and the leatherback. Before we were using TEDs in the trawl nets, over 5,000 turtles were caught every year. Unfortunately, some of them didn't survive because turtles are marine reptiles and so they need to come to the surface to breathe. So if the, they were caught while the nets were down catching the prawns, the turtles couldn't get to the surface. In the late 90s and the year 2000, scientists helped the fishery to start using TEDs in their nets. So what exactly is a TED? A TED is a large metal grid that is sewn into the trawl net on an angle. At the bottom or top of the TED is a big hole in the net that the turtle can swim out of and continue on its way. The TED is on an angle to help guide the turtle or other large animals like sharks or rays towards that escape hole. The impact of putting these grids in the trawl nets was significant and the number of turtles being caught went from 5,000 to less than 100 a year with 99% surviving. These days, if a turtle does get caught, it's usually in the trinet, and a trinet is a small trawl net that the fishers use to check if the prawns are around. So these nets only go underwater for a very short period of time, and if a turtle happens to get caught in it, the crew can get it out and release it back into the water straight away. Our other big success story has been the use of bycatch reduction devices, or BRDs. These have also been in the nets since around the same time as the TEDs and are special devices sewn into the net closer to the catch to let the small fish out or bycatch. So what exactly is bycatch? Well, bycatch is that part of the catch and in, for us, the small fish, that the fisher doesn't want to keep and that goes back into the water. We've had a few different devices being used by the fishers since 2001, but five years ago, we decided they weren't good enough. They were letting the fish out, but we wanted something that would get a lot more fish out while keeping the prawns in the nets. So our fishers designed some new devices that were tested on the trawlers for the scientists. And these new devices reduced the bycatch by up to 44%, letting all those small fish out. And now all of our fishers are using them. So these are two great examples of what the MPF has done to be a more sustainable fishery and to reduce our environmental footprint. We've been MSC certified as a sustainable fishery since 2012, and we know how important it is to look after our oceans so we can catch the yummy prawns that people love to eat. Wow, thank you, Adrienne. That's some wonderful work you're doing over at the Northern Prawn Fishery. Unfortunately, due to some technical issues, we won't be joined by a fish farm today. However, instead, we have Duncan Ledbitter from the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, and he has offered to answer all of your questions about fish farming. And you can ask them at Mentimeter. So just to remind you, the code is 9032-4818. If you haven't heard of aquaculture before, then Duncan is going to start by explaining to us exactly what aquaculture is. Hi, my name is Duncan Ledger and I work for the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. I have a science degree and a strong interest in fish. I go fishing, I take pictures of fish and I eat fish. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council is a global organisation which encourages responsible aquaculture. So what is aquaculture? Aquaculture is the farming of animals such as fish, prawns and oysters as well as plants like seaweed. 
Aquaculture has been practiced for thousands of years. In Victoria, the Aboriginal people farmed eels at a place called Fujbim, and this is the oldest known aquaculture site in the world. When the Europeans first arrived, they started farming oysters. But in recent decades, the number of species has grown and now includes a variety of finfish such as kingfish and salmon, as well as yabbies, prawns, abalone and seaweed. So why do people farm animals like fish? The main reason is that like farming plants and animals on land, it makes the supply a lot more regular because, for example, the catching of wild fish can be subject to bad weather or seasonal changes. Like any other human activity, aquaculture can cause problems for the environment unless it's practiced responsibly. For example, when it comes to the farming of fish in cages, putting too much food in just sinks to the bottom, and all this does is create food for worms and not for fish. And then there is the problem of food. Fish and prawns poo just like any other animal. It sinks to the seabed where it becomes food for worms, just like cow poo does on land. If there's too much of it though in a small space, it can cause water quality problems. So how can this be avoided? Making sure the fish farm is properly located is a great start. The fish cages where fish are farmed, putting it in deep water where there's strong currents can help distribute the worm food. For prawn ponds, the water can be filtered before it's disposed of into the environment. This can be done by artificial wetlands or using seaweeds. The seaweed can then be used as fertiliser. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council sets standards for responsible aquaculture. A standard is like a test where you have to meet certain requirements before you pass. Each standard covers all sorts of aspects, such as ensuring good water quality, making sure that fish are healthy, making sure that the workers are properly paid, and ensuring that local communities are treated properly. With more people in the world and an increasing demand for seafood, the only way that this can be met is by aquaculture. If it's done responsibly, there can be long-term jobs, a healthy environment and food for the future. There are lots of different ways that water quality can be protected. Can you think of some examples? Thanks, Duncan. So in order to feed a growing population, we need both wild fisheries and responsible aquaculture. It's important when we buy our seafood that we choose from sustainable fisheries and farms that are protecting our marine life and preventing pollution to have a healthy future full of fish. An easy way to do this is to look for the green and blue labels on your seafood, which mean that the farms and fisheries where that seafood came from are doing the right thing to protect our environment. So now it's your turn to ask us some questions. We've got Duncan here, who's going to answer your questions about fish farms. Hi, Duncan. And I'm also going, I'm also going to introduce you to Dr. Adrian Gutteridge from the Marine Stewardship Council, who will answer your questions about sustainable fishing. And Dr. Adrian is also an expert on fish, uh, sharks, shark biology, in fact. So if you have any questions about sharks that you'd like to send to Dr. Adrian, he'll be the man for you. Hi, Adrian. Hi Alexis, how are you going? Oh, fabulously, learning a ton. So we've got our first question come through and this one I'm going to throw to you Adrian. If any, how many fish have gone extinct from fishing? If any, how many have gone extinct? Well that's a good question. I'm not sure actually. Um, lots have been like depleted and uh, put to levels where they can't really sustain their populations. Uh, the a, like a big example is uh, cod from the north uh, hemisphere in uh, Europe, but some of those populations have come back pretty well. Uh, one fish that has gone extinct in Australia in certain parts of its range are sawfish. So they're like a big uh, flat stingray with a big long nose that has teeth coming out of it. Uh, I think they're almost the only fish that's ever been declared extinct in New South Wales. So they, they're found in northern Australian waters these days, uh, and that's the only place you can pretty much find them there in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and they just used to get caught in like, lots of nets and stuff because they've obviously got this long uh, nose that has teeth in it that is perfect for getting caught in nets. So, yeah, that one comes to mind. But, yeah, lots of other fish have been uh, heavily depleted around the world. Some of the big uh, bluefin tuna, for example, 
and yeah, cod from the North Atlantic is one of the classic overfishing stories. Okay, so that's something we want to prevent from happening in the future anymore, but very interesting information. Duncan, the next question is for you. What are the most common things farmed in aquaculture? Hi, hi Alexis. I realised before when you said hello, I was on mute, so I've now unmuted myself. Um, so globally, the most commonly farmed species are carps. So particularly in Asia, carp is a, and different types of carps are really important for people, particularly in poor rural areas. In other countries, salmon um, is very common. So in Australia, we farm Atlantic salmon and also, which is a very commonly farmed species in um, South America and also um, Scandinavia. But globally, there's also a lot of different um, prawns are farmed. So particularly in Asia and also in um, Northern Australia and Central America as well. Thank you, Duncan. Um, the next one, we're going back to sharks and fishing. So Adrian, I'll ask you to answer this one, please. What type of animals are the most fished or killed due to overfishing or bycatch? Yeah, right. So the most caught uh, species are probably fish. Um, so those, uh, yeah, things like the, the big tuners, uh, some of the more uh, common, commonly caught species in the world. There's uh, fish from uh, deep water uh, that are called, well, they're grouped into things called whitefish. Some of those fisheries are, you know, upwards of a million ton uh, fisheries, but they can be done sustainably. And when it comes to bycatch, uh, lots of different animals get caught in fisheries as bycatch, but, you know, specifically to things like sharks, they get caught in a lot of longline fisheries. So fisheries that operate out in the open ocean that fish for tuna, um, they will catch a lot of uh, different sharks and also turtles. Uh, but there are ways they can reduce that by uh, changing their gear type so they don't use certain types of hooks and they don't use wire traces. Um, so those are the kind of things you want to see in a, a sustainable fishery is trying to reduce those numbers and making sure that the fishermen are aware that they have impacts and they can do something about it uh, to change their, their ways. Thanks, Adrian. A little question of my own. Are there some fisheries that are doing something to protect seals like Nala, who we met earlier? Yeah, there are. Um, so similar to what was getting shown before with um, some of the uh, turtle excluding devices, um, in areas where trawling happens and there are seals. They have a similar thing called seal excluding devices. Uh, and they also, you know, lots of those fisheries will not operate in areas where the seals are in high numbers so that you don't get those interactions. And so closed areas is a big one for those kind of uh, species. And yeah, definitely modifying gear so that you don't end up with, um, you know, interacting with seals as much as you would if you didn't have those kind of modifications in your gear type. That's a relief. I'm so pleased to hear that. Thanks, Adrian. The next question is, how can I reduce bycatch and my impact when I'm fishing? Adrian, we'll, we'll shoot that one to you if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Well, Duncan and I can probably both answer this because we like going fishing ourselves. Um, well, there's, you know, various things you can do. If you like getting in the water and looking at animals while you collect your fish, then spear fishing is a good one because you pretty much look at what you go for and you're not going to, uh, you know, hit anything with a spear, hopefully, that you didn't intend to. Um, if you're fishing yourself, you can also, you know, change the gear that you use. Uh, you might be using some sort of lure. Uh, one of the big ones you can do, though, if you're catching, like using a, a bait or something that's going to catch a lot of different fish is fishing hooks have a little barb on them. So before you go fishing, you can crimp those down with a pair of pliers or something, and that can be used to get a hook out relatively easily. Uh, Duncan, anything else you want to add there as well? Yeah, as, as Adrian said, I also enjoy going fishing and catching and eating my own fish. And I, so I go spear fishing and I look at what I want to catch and it makes it, um, you know, making mistakes um, a lot harder. But if you're a good fisher person, then you know where you want to go to catch the fish you want. And so that helps you to reduce um, the chance of catching something you don't want. So, yeah, you go at night to a, 
particular place or go to a particular part of the beach where you know that the species you want are living and that helps reduce your chances of getting bycatch. And Duncan, are there any people that are fish farming in their own homes? Sorry, Alexis, I didn't hear the second part of the question. Are there any are there any people that are fish farming at their own homes? Ah, well, my neighbour across the road, um, he in in summertime he's tried growing barramundi in a backyard swimming pool. Um, but it gets sometimes it gets a little bit too hot and the water temp the water oxygen content isn't enough. But he also farms trout in the winter time, and so he goes and buys some small fingerling trout, and um, he um, feeds them over the winter when the water's cold, and so he has some fresh fish um, to eat or to make smoked trout um, probably in around about August or September. How oh, exciting! I hope. Um, the next um, no. <laughs> Sorry. Our next question is, um, when I'm buying fish at the shops, what species are the most sustainable to eat? Um, Duncan, could you answer that one for us? Well, I, I think we've seen the um, videos about the, um, the role of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. And so if you want to be certain, then you need to look for the ASC label, which you'll find on some types of fish, so for example, some Australian farmed kingfish, but also some um, farmed salmon, both grown in Australia and outside of Australia. And you may also find the ASC label on prawns, which are farmed either outside or inside Australia as well. And Dr. Adrian, do you have any species that you think are some of the best ones to buy at the supermarket? Yeah, just like Duncan, uh, I would add that uh, look for the MSC blue fish tick. So you can find that on cans of tuna uh, that John West sell because uh, John West is the best. Uh, so that one, I eat all I eat that all the time. Pretty much every day I have a can of tuna from uh, John West with the MSC blue label on it. Uh, there's prawns from the northern prawn fishery, which we saw before. You can get those at uh, supermarket wet fish counters. And then in the frozen food section, you know, I got a four-year-old daughter and an 18-month-old daughter, and they pretty much eat fish fingers uh, with the MSC logo on them three or four times a week. Uh, and that's a species called hokey, which is caught in New Zealand. But as long as you're looking for either the ASC or the MSC logo in your supermarket, then you're doing the right thing and you're supporting sustainable fisheries and sustainable aquaculture. Good to know. Thanks, Adrian. I've got a question for you now about sharks. This one is, are sharks and rays related? Yes, they are. Sharks and rays are very closely related. They are cartilaginous fish in a group uh, in their taxonomy called elasmobranchs. So probably 100 million, 150 million years ago, there was probably one type of group of um, animals that looked like sharks we have today. And then they diverged and created another group of elasmobranchs, which was the ray. So they kind of flattened out and started to uh, have their gills underneath their head uh, and their eyes on the top. Uh, but they are very similar. They have very similar characteristics in their biology in that they produce live young, they grow very slowly, and they have um, li uh, yeah, so live young. And so what that means is both those groups, sharks and rays, are very vulnerable to fishing. And so the protection that you need for both those types of animals is the same. Fantastic. Thank you, Adrian. Um, our next question. What is your favourite shark and why? My favourite shark? Okay. I'm actually glad you asked. And this wasn't a setup, by the way, but this is my favourite shark. So this is a species called the slit eye shark. Now, it's a whaler shark, so it is uh, closely related to things like bull sharks and tiger sharks. Uh, but unlike those animals, which get to, you know, two and a half to three metres, that slit eye shark only ever gets to about 90 centimetres. And I did my PhD on that animal, so I have a very soft spot, soft spot for them. And I think the reason they're my favourite animal is that they 
produce only ever two young per female and the pups are born at half the size of the adults. So that's sort of like a human giving birth to like a 10 year old child, which is cringeworthy in some respects, but I thought fascinating. And it differs in its biology from all the other similarly uh, related whaler sharks of its size. So yeah, definitely the slit eye shark. Second would be a great hammerhead shark because they're awesome and they look funky. Oh, I like the hammerhead sharks too. I think they're my favourite. Approximately how many fish are caught in Australian waters every day? Duncan, maybe you could answer that one for us. Oh, every day. Oh, my goodness. Um, so Australia's um, fishery production each year is about 220,000 tonnes. And I can't do the mathematics in my head, sorry, Alexis. So somebody smarter than me is going to have to divide 220,000 by 365, and there's your answer. Thanks. That was a good effort anyway. Thanks, Duncan. So we're going to have our last question now because we're running out of time, unfortunately. Duncan, could you tell us how do you get rid of fish poop? Um, well, how long have we got? So um, fish are like all other animals and um, they do poos. If you're a cow in a field, when you do a poo, it drops to the ground and worms and beetles um, eat it, uh, dung beetles. Same thing happens in a, for fish. So the poo drops to the seabed and it's eaten by worms, which then become fish food. <laughs> but if you want to reduce it from being a problem, then um, you need to make sure that your fish farm is located where there's good water currents and in relatively deep water. And the other thing you can do is make sure that you move the cages around so the amount of poo doesn't overwhelm the capacity of the worms to, to eat it. Fantastic. Well, so I want to thank everyone for sending in your questions and for joining us for this Sustainable Seafood Week lesson. And I want to thank our presenters today. Thank you, Duncan. See you later. See you later. And thanks, Dr. Adrian. No worries. Thank you. So today's event marks the launch of a brand new learning resource that we've created and that you can use in the classroom. And we'll be sending that around after this event. We also have a Kahoot quiz challenge about what we've learned during this lesson, which will be open until the end of the month. So if you'd like to complete the quiz, you could be in the running to win a family pass tickets to Taronga Zoo. We'll send out the details for this Kahoot challenge after the event. But for those who, of you who are ready to go, the game pin is 0480-2064. Thanks very much for joining us today and we'll see you all next time. Bye now. Thank <laughs> you.